So now, I was supposed to have Professor Olinga Talit. And let's see if I can uh, find him. Let's see. Do I have a connection here? Let's see if we... There he is. Okay, wonderful. Yeah? Okay. Um, hello, Olinga. Let me first talk to the audience for a moment and then explain who you are and why, you, why we're talking to a guy in, an, uh, in a hospital bed. Okay, so um, Professor Olinga Talit is a very special person. He was just an entrepreneur. He had a bunch of TV stations and, and a couple of, and an energy company, and he had a lot of different things. And then he had a life-changing uh, experience, not like today that he fell off his horse, but he then sold all the business and he went into a different mm -hmm. business. And he said, we need to have not only financial data to describe how good companies are doing, but we need all kinds of other data, how well they are a corporate, how well they are cont contributing to society, how well they're contributing to the people who work everywhere. And he came up with not a uh, PE, uh, PE factor, but he came up with... What, what, what was the name of your, uh, of your social factor, um, uh, Olinga? Social, social earnings ratio. The social, social earnings, earnings ratio. ratio. And that's being calculated now for a lot of companies all over the world. And he's basically, that is in itself an incredible story. Well, he was going to talk here today and, um, about, uh, um, about his involvement with the Chinese government. But then he fell off his horse. And uh, yeah, we now see you there in this hospital. How are you doing? What, what's happening with you? Actually, actually, all fine, all fine. I had some blood in the brain, but they told me that uh, it's not increasing, so I'll be discharged in the next few hours. Thank okay, you. good. That's really good. So he was sorry that he couldn't make it. But what's so interesting about it, he is being asked, as a professor who's basically into, social, uh, social, into the appreciation of the social participation at the uh, Chinese government blockchain uh, work group and to participate and, uh, and, and, and he's saying that and, and I wonder why do they want somebody like you in this, uh, in this, uh, in this um, blockchain uh, or this is actually the e-commerce work group and you have a couple of famous people there who, uh, who, are, who, are, who are other members of that organization of that group okay so I guess uh, if, let, let's start with what you know. So you will know, everyone in the audience will know that the SEC in America is com it considers anything to do with blockchain and cr cryptocurrency as a financial instrument. And they are doing their very best to shoehorn every product as a financial instrument uh, so they can regulate it. And that is kind of typical of the American values, which are the land of the free. And in, in America, you know, if you have money, then it doesn't matter if you're American, if you're Mexican, a woman, or black, you are do fine. If you don't have money, then there is difficulty. In China, they do not, they are not a major believer in that every individual has certain rights. What they believe in is the rights of the corpus of the whole body and in their situation they are looking at instruments to change the society and there are four instruments AI blockchain IOT and then there's other which has all these other technologies because what they say is that they have 1.4 billion people to take care of and they need systems and big data products to manage and safeguard the society. And in essence, this new committee that came out of the Ministry of Commerce, is called the China Blockchain Committee, is there to help to regulate the market, which represents around 70% of the world cryptocurrency and blockchain market. We have more patents in China than the rest of the world put together in blockchain. Uh huh. Okay. So blockchain is an essential, a, a very essential technology, just like AI. We heard a lot about it about AI, but also about the blockchain. But 
what is the goal that this government, do they want to take care of people or do they want to organize people or do they want to control people? What is the intention of the Chinese government in your experience? And uh, you're in a hospital bed, you can talk freely. But what, does the really, what is the goal of the government with those 1.4 billion? How, how honest... Okay, so... Okay, so it will, it will stick in, in the gullets of people in the West, but the fact is their goal is to safeguard their society and their values. And things like the One Belt, One Road are there to, if you, if you wish to uh, support that belief as a global soft power instrument. So I guess one of the best ways to illustrate this is that if I said in Holland, or in America, we wish to eradicate poverty, yeah. as in zero poverty, zero. I would say the politicians would typically say, give it 20 years, 30 years. SDGs are 20, 30, 12 years, 11 years. The Chinese government say they will er eradicate poverty. The last 1% of poverty is by the year 2020 in 12 months' time. So in order to do such a thing, they need instruments to be able to change a society. And so that is an illustration of their intent to eradicate poverty. How it affects in reality, of course, is much more difficult and uh -huh. needs to be refined. Yeah. You're together on that, uh, on that nice committee with Jack May from uh, Ali uh, Baba, and I think the next time when you're in October there, the, the Chinese uh, uh, president, who's been elected for life, I think, oh no, no, but he's, uh, he's been elected for a while, he will be there too. What kind of things are you thinking about? What kind of blockchain, uh, what kind of blockchain uh, solutions are currently on the table? Okay, so many of you will know in China there's something called Alipay, and you have WeChat Pay, which are effectively a third generation payment systems, as opposed to MasterCard and uh, Visa and uh, American Express. Well, they are working now, they are wishing to promote a fourth generation payment system, which is like Alipay, but distributed. A, a payment system which can be owned by the people. Really? Everyone who uses it, yeah. But Absolutely. I mean, and I, I mean, Jack, Jack from Alipay is on your board. He he could not be. No. I mean, wouldn't he be? Or he's on the same group. Would he be interested that his own system, which is serving 600 million, is being, you know, being uh, gets competition from a more government-oriented system? Okay. Small correction. Jack Ma sits on the Ministry of Commerce committee that appointed us, so he doesn't oh, okay. sit on our board. Okay. So, but Small but it's program, fine. Yeah. So 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 I I guess. Uh, they are looking towards the advancement, constant advancement of their systems. So they, I mean, we, ch I mean, Alipay is bigger than MasterCard and Visa put together. It's enormous. And they say, okay, but well, what's the next generation? It's something that actually represents the people as in owned by the people. Uh -huh. We're working with, you know, so typically if you look at one, there's one product that we're working, but I, I won't announce it yet, but we'll, we may announce it very shortly, that actually is a distributed, like blockchain, payment system of Alipay. These are, you know, typically the large-scale operations that are trying to do. Yeah. Is there, are you doing something also um, which would be interesting in terms of identity? Because you have this social index system where everybody, where the government keeps track of everybody, and if you... I mean, we then only hear that if they run the lights, uh, if you run a red light, you get problems, but also you, get, you can get po positive points. Is identity and this whole tracking and tracing of the individuals, what they do well and not well for society, is that also something they're considering to put on the blockchain? So th this is uh, very much in the, in the central core of our interest. So yes, they have a social credit system, and if the people in the audience don't know, it basically rewards good behaviors in society and, and punishes behaviors which are not considered to be good by the government. So good actors are going to allow to travel, they can travel abroad, they can get tickets, they can get discounts in retail, etc. 
Now, anyone who's been to China, for example, recently will know now you need to have your fingerprints before you get your visa. You need facial recognition before you get your visa. Yeah. And when you're in China, you are monitored from every single aspect of, of your movement. Now, I think a good illustration of how draconian or, or not, or how Orwell, Orwellian this is, is a few months ago, a lady crossed the street in Shanghai, and her picture was picked up as jaywalking, looked on the internet, and they put a display up in the street saying that this woman has jaywalked. <laughs> it, it turned out that it wasn't her. And she complained, and she said she wasn't in that city. And the authorities said, actually, you're right. It's not you. It's just software. It's going to improve. Yeah. Now, the same situation in, in New York would have led to, what, 12 lawsuits, right? Because it's the rights of the individual has been, has been you know, interrupted. Yeah. In China, they said, okay, our intention was that it's a mistake. We'll correct it. So clearly, there are going to be eggs that will be broken. Mistakes are going to be made while trying to cook this thing. And the Chinese are more comfortable living with this because they believe in the ultimate goal. Uh -huh. Okay. And how do you feel as a Westerner or as a complex cultural person, because you also have a different, uh, different cultural identity, how do you feel coming from Western values and living in England and and trying to uh, do things to improve the world. How do you feel in participating in something like that? Does it feel comfortable? Okay, so that's a very good question. You know, for Thank years, you. for the last decade, I've been working on the idea of non-financial value, as you said in the introduction. And what is the currency of non-financial value? We know the currency of financial value is the dollar, but what it is, what is the currency of non-financial value? And looking at structures for good to try and change society. And I admire the Chinese government for having an attempt to change society for good. It is, in my experience, probably the only state, sovereign state, actually making a, a large-scale attempt to change their society for good. It may not be the right way. It may not be perfect, but it is a genuine attempt. And I admire and applaud that. Okay. Professor Olinga, thank you very much for uh, speaking to us from your hospital bed. I hope to see you the next time alive because your thinking and how you dare to go cross borders and also give us clear opinions is very inspiring. Thank you very much and good health to you. Thank you, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Take care. Bye -bye. <laughs> well, okay. This guy has always, done, you know, he's worked his whole life to be, after he sold his companies and, and got, I think, 50 or 60 million for it, so he's individual rich. He really worked very hard to get those social index uh, to, uh, system to get it up and running. And he's now, you know, in the, in the heart of this blockchain development in China. And last year we had a couple of speakers from China. And uh, they all said, oh, we do a little proof of concept here, 10 million people, and this really worked well, and now we have 100 million people here. We started with one city, now we have 50 cities. You know, it's really, the scale was unbelievable last year. And now they're basically making a loyalty point system for, uh, you know, air miles for the whole, for your whole life. You know, it's just, air, that's, that's basically what it is, air miles for your whole life, or, or uh, and that's, that's really, uh, I don't know if it's really scary. I think it's really interesting that he wants to eradicate uh, poverty and in a very short period of time. So it's really interesting. We needed to take a look at it and I thought it was wonderful. Now, what did he say that the two technologies were that were really number one and two in China? What was that? AI and, and blockchain.